Hi, um, I'm Kimberly Smith. I'm the senior manager of the molecular biology team. Um, thank you for that terrific talk. Next, we're going to hear from our, the first of our next generation leaders, Simona Laudato. Simona received her undergraduate degree in biological sciences from the University of Naples in Italy and was awarded her PhD from the European School of Molecular Medicine. As a postdoc at Harvard, she unveiled fundamental aspects of the molecular logic behind the acquisition of subtype-specific projection neuron identity. She also discovered that the subtype-specific projection neuron identity impacts the behavior of cortical inner neurons controlling the development of functional networks in the cerebral cortex. Simona is going to start her own laboratory as an assistant professor in early 2017. So welcome, Simona. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks for this uh, fantastic opportunity. I'm truly delighted to be here today to tell you about my work on the development of the Hold on, sorry. <laughs> the development of the neural circuits in the cerebral cortex. I want to first apologize for my voice. I got a terrible cold last week in Boston. That's what happened when you have kids around and <coughs> I get all the words from them. Um, I guess for this audience, uh, can I get some help here? Sorry. I don't think it's more, we no, no. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was pressing the one. You sure? Uh, I just want to move on the slides. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, I was just going to introduce you the cerebral cortex, and I thought that for this audience it was may not be necessary to actually give a big introduction. I just want to remind you that the, cort the cerebral cortex is the part of our brain that has undergone the most pronounced expansion during evolution. And if we, as humans, are able to uh, perceive the world surrounding us the way we do, uh, even just simply appreciating a glass of good Italian wine or just communicating an idea in one or multiple languages or even just um, controlling the movements of our fingers. I can, t I can get mine if you want. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Excuse me. So it's not a pointer. Should we launch it again? We tried it before, right? <laughs> Sorry, I was not supposed to be seen. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. OK. So again, you know, if we're able to do all the things I just listed, it's actually thanks to the fact that we have a cerebral cortex. And as one could guess from the variety of tasks that this organ is responsible for, it's a highly complex organ that is populated, as we heard from this beautiful talk before, uh, from a large, by a large variety of different neuronal cell types, which have been historically classified in two major groups of neurons. Um, the excited reproduction neuron, which represents the overall majority of the neuronal population in the cortex, and the inhibitor interneurons, which are much fewer in numbers, but they have the crucial role of modulating the activity of the projection neurons. Now, the proper interaction between these two large classes of neurons in the cortex is crucial for any uh, execution of the task that I just listed before, and many more, and for any cortical activity, to the point that any alteration of this balance in any direction I should actually See, say, it's often associated with the onset of many neurological conditions, including epilepsy or schizophrenia, or you name one. But it's, um, <coughs> of course, this 
broad classification into classes is just the tip of the iceberg. As, as we heard, there are many, many different subtypes of projection neurons and interneurons in the uh, six layers of the mammalian cortex, and many more that I could possibly schematize, and probably more than we're actually uh, going to discover soon. Um, they can be distinguished upon their morphology, their pattern of um, connectivity, their electrophysiological traits, their molecular profile, and so on and so forth. But it's interesting to know that the, all these different classes of projection neurons and interneurons are wired together into the six layers of the cortex in a highly stereotyped manner to form networks, functional networks. And in particular, the connection between the projection neurons and the interneurons are called local circuits or microcircuits, and they're highly stereotyped. And I feel that it's, as a developmental biologist, I feel that it's remarkable that all this uh, diversity, neuronal diversity, is actually achieved and generated during development, almost all before birth, for both projection neurons and interneurons. And even more remarkable, that projection neurons and interneurons that eventually have to come together in the same layers of the cortex, so in proximity, during development are actually not generated from um, the same pool of progenitor or from uh, a close uh, proliferative zone, but are instead generated from very distant regions of the developing brain. So, and in these schematics here, I'm just showing two coronal sections where the brain, the developing brain, has been cut along this plane. And you can see that interneurons and projection neurons are indeed born from distant regions of the developing brain, with interneurons generated in the ventral part of the developing telencephalon, and more precisely from structures that are called medial and caudal ganglionic eminence, from which they have to migrate a long way up to the cerebral cortex <coughs> over a uh, several days uh, journey along tangential routes to finally get their location in the cerebral cortex. On the other hand, the projection neurons are generated locally in the dorsal telencephalon up here in, from progenitors that reside along the um, ventricular surface. And they migrate radially in a very stereotyped manner known as an um, inside-out pattern of migration where the youngest neurons bypass the oldest neurons to uh, position themselves in the most superficial layers. So this generation and migration is not only spatially controlled, but also tightly controlled in a time fashion, since the different neuronal types that are, pro projection neuron types that are generated are actually uh, generated in, uh, in a sequel. And here I'm just schematizing a couple of uh, classes that I'm gonna be telling you about uh, during my talk. So the first neuron generated are actually the corticothalamic neurons, which are located in layer six. Those neurons are responsible for sending cortical feedback to the relay neurons in the, uh, in the thalamus on sensory processing information, which are followed by subcerebral projection neurons. Those are neurons located in layer five, just above. Uh, they're born just a day or so after, and they are uh, connecting the cortex to all the different uh, targets below the cerebrum, below the brain, including the spinal cord. Most of them are involved in uh, motor function, controlling motor function. And lastly, we can find the commissural neurons, which are the neurons that are responsible to integrate bilateral, the bilateral information among the two sides of our cortex. Um, via sending an axon either through the corpus callosum, which is the major dorsal commissure of our brain, or the anterior commissure, which is the most ancient and ventral commissure of the um, vertebrate brain. <coughs> of course, this is just to give you an idea of the, the of feeling uh, or the diversity uh, that is generated during development. But the story I'd like to tell you today is actually about the how and the why of such neuronal diversity. So what I mean is, what are the molecular uh, principles that govern the acquisition of a specific class of neurons during development? And uh, why should we care about this diversity? Why do we need so many different neuronal uh, types in, uh, to actually shape um, uh, a mammalian cortex? And I'll show you some data that point at uh, the effect of new projection neuron diversity in helping building the um, cortical uh, microcircuit assembly. 
So to begin investigating the first question about how one specific class of neurons is generated, I had to focus on one specific class uh, of neurons. And I decided to focus on corticospinal motor neurons. So these are uh, a class of subcerebral projection neurons. Those are located in layer five, large pyramidal neurons, which have very long axons. In humans, their axon can be, uh, can be as long as one meter. Um, those are um, therapeutically relevant as they degenerate in many motor, many motor neuron uh, disease, including ALS. But most of all, for my question, those neurons are among the best characterized at the molecular level. Since already 10 years ago, a master transcription factor, namely FASF2, had been identified that as required and for the birth and specification of these neurons. And indeed, in absence of FASF2, you can see that this nice band of CTIP2 positive uh, neurons, where CTIP2 is a prototypical marker of corticospinal motor neurons in layer five, is actually completely lost here. And together with CTIP2, many other markers of corticospinal motor neuron were completely absent when FASF2 was knock, knocked out. And there was no connection in this mouse model between the cortex and the spinal cord. Nevertheless, another population of excitatory projection neuron would develop in place. Is we did not have a lack of neurons in this cortex, but another population was actually developing in place and acquired different identity of commissural identity in this case. <coughs> but how did FAS actually instruct the corticospinal motor neuron identity? How was able to uh, shape this identity? And to address this question, I designed an in vivo screening um, by acutely purifying um, pro cortical progenitor. They would normally not express FASF2. They would normally give rise to the callosal lineage, the neurons that connect the two hemispheres. Short after, uh, overexpressing FASF2, so by neutral elaboration, sorry. Uh, and you can see here the schematics were overexpressed both construct and after 24 and 48 hours, I could uh, acutely purify them and profile the transcriptional, uh, the transcriptomes and compare them. And to cut a very long story short, this approach led me to the identification of many uh, downstream target of FASF2, many corticospinal motor neuron specific genes they were actually expressed both at early and late time point of corticospinal motor neuron development, suggesting that already within 48 hours, FASF2 alone was able to induce a whole program of corticospinal motor neuron identity in these cortical progenitors, while concomitantly repressing the callosal fate that was originally in place in these progenitors. But how did FAS regulate these uh, target genes? And to address this question, we appeared up with uh, Sean Mahoney and David Gifford at um, MIT and perform a genome-wide uh, sequencing analysis, a chip sack for FASF2. And what we found was surprisingly uh, interesting. We found that FAS preferentially associate with promoter regions, with over 80% of its peaks being found um, within 5 KB from the transcription start site of any um, annotated gene. And more interesting for what my question, I found that these, um, the FAS preferential associate with genes that are specific of corticospinal motor neuron lineage compared to other neuronal lineages. So this data, <coughs> excuse me, together with the with uh, transcriptional uh, data suggests led me to, uh, to formulate an hypothesis by which FASF2 is actually, could be a selector genes for um, corticospinal motor neuron identity. And by that I mean a gene that is controlling and shaping the acquisition of a specific identity by directly regulating um, a battery of genes downstream. And each genes in turn and collectively is responsible to execute a specific module of the identity of that, uh, of that specific neuron type. And although this model will take probably uh, much more effort and many years to, to be fully validated, uh, in this study, I decided to um, test it functionally by um, 
uh, taking into account two specific features of corticospinal motor neuron identity. One is the axonal targeting, a very distinctive trait of this neuronal type. I told you those are neurons that connect the cortex to the spinal cord, and they're actually the only neurons in the cortex that are able to send an axon so distant. So this was a very uh, fundamental and defining feature for corticospinal motor neurons. And the other feature instead, their neurotransmitter choice, is rather a share uh, features of all the projection, excitatory projection neurons in the cortex. But nevertheless, it's a fundamental feature for an excitatory neuron to be able to communicate within a circuit in a functional way. And for both this uh, feature, I was able to identify the effector gene, namely FB1 and VGLUT1, um, that act in downstream of FASF2 and uh, actually <coughs> are able to uh, execute, at least in part, one component of this module uh, to, to eventually uh, um, define the identity of these uh, neuron types. And I think that, <coughs> excuse me, by exploiting this uh, model, the FASF2 model, um, we were able to identify the first selector gene of the mammalian uh, cerebral cortex, and uh, suggesting that this at least is one of the uh, component by which the neuronal diversity is accomplished during um, the development of the projection neurons. But recently, I also became interested in understanding how this diversity is actually maintained during, um, after development, after development is over. And uh, given this, uh, the, pronounced, uh, the, the prominent function of FASF2 during development for corticospinal motor neuron, and its um, peculiar um, sustained expression specifically in corticospinal motor neuron, you can see here with the red line, uh, in the adulthood, I started asking the question whether FASF2 could actually be responsible to maintain the identity of these neurons uh, also uh, after development was uh, ended. And although this project is just at the beginning, because we had to generate multiple lines uh, to address this question, I just want to share with you the strategy that I'm, um, I'm going to use, the approach I'm going to use to address this question. And indeed, we, had gen we generated uh, a FASF2 conditional lines to um, conditionally remo uh, remove FASF2 later on after development um, is ended. Uh, and another uh, Cree driver line here, tserg one l with a where, t, where the Cree line, where the Cree um, is driven by the expression of this um, TSERG gene, which is specifically expressed in a subtype um, of corticospinal, um, corticospinal motor neurons. So this, I hope, I, <coughs> you can see that by understanding how corticospinal motor neuron uh, maintain their identity, uh, we can actually start investigating how, in general, diversity is maintained in the mature cortex, and if any of the developmental inspired molecular logics is actually in place to maintain the identity of these neurons uh, after the development is uh, ended. <coughs> But at the beginning of my talk, I told you that projection neurons and interneurons are tightly uh, interconnected, and they form functional cortical circuits, which are fundamental for uh, function. So let me tell you about interneurons a little bit. Those are a class of neurons that, is, if possible, it, it is even more heterogeneous than projection neurons, to the point that, based on their morphology, their molecular uh, identity, on their electrophysiological traits, nowadays we still don't, cannot agree upon on a unified nomenclature for these uh, neuron types. Thanks to the seminal work of many labs, including Oscar Marine Lab and Gorfi Schell's lab, uh, among others, we have learned that the time and space during development uh, by which these um, interneurons are generated um, strongly shapes the, the final fate they will acquire in the mature brains. And we have come up with the three not overlapping uh, interneuron population that we have already heard this morning, somatostat and parvalgum, which are mainly um, located in the deep layers of the cortex and generated early from the medial ganglionic eminence, versus the VAP and carretinin population, which are generated later on from the caudal ganglionic eminence and mainly populated in the upper layers of the cortex. But once these cardinal features, those cardinal identities have been defined, how do cortical interneurons, which are born in the ventral part of the brain, enter the cortex and find their final location. So, <coughs> 
had already been suggested that the migration of interneurons in the cortex and their um, dispersion throughout the, the cortical layers was not exclusively cell intrinsic, and rather the interneurons would be able to feel the environment they were entering in. But they decided to, to, to ask a specific question whether the diversity of the distinct classes of projection neuron could actually have a role in understand, in, in suggesting or indicating the interneurons where to position themselves uh, in the different layers of the cortex. And again, to address this question, I took advantage of the FASF2, oh, sorry. <laughs> of the FASF2 knockout models, but let me remind you, a specific class of projection neuron, the corticospinal motor neurons, are completely absent, they are never generated. And another class of projection neurons, excitatory projection neurons, um, gets, uh, develops. And those have a completely different identity, they are the express commissural uh, markers, they send their axon through the anterior commissure, so they are different uh, projection neuron types. While the rest of the cortex remain pretty much unaltered. Uh, <coughs> I should also point at this, uh, at this moment that FASF2 is never expressed in interneurons, neither in the progenitors or the migrating interneurons. So it's, um, it was really important for us to understand what happened to the interneurons once they, once they enter uh, the cortex and would they feel the difference. So in here I'm showing you the, the raw data where we can see that the, um, in the somatostatin interneurons, which are mainly populated, populating in the deep layers of the cortex, in absence of FASF2, uh, they're actually uh, spreading across all the cortical wall. And you can see that by, um, upon counting, upon quantification, we can see that much less interneurons are located in uh, layer five, and more interneurons are now located in the upper layers. Similarly, the um, parvalvoin interneurons, which show um, a similar distribution where less pravalbum interneurons were found in layer five and more interneurons were found in the upper layers. Interestingly though, the carretinin population, which are actually neurons, interneurons that are born later and position themselves in the upper layers of the cortex, don't seem to notice any difference in uh, layer five. I can, can laminate perfectly both in the wall type and in phase of two uh, knockout condition. So this data strongly suggested that projection neuron guide interneuron distribution in a very specific, sub, in a very subtype specific manner. And we wanted to understand if this had any impact at the physiological level in terms of the physio overall physiology of this uh, brain. And we pair up with Akao Hensch uh, lab at Harvard University to understand if this, oh, this abnormal distribution of interneurons would actually have any effect on the excitation inhibition uh, balance. And by simply performing a VSDI um, experiment, a voltage sensitive dye imaging experiment, we could actually see that by injecting a current pulse here in the white matter in the same time frame in between wall type and knockout, we could follow the spread of activity of, uh, of, with the, by this uh, dye and see it rapidly spreading up in the upper layers in a wall type, while in the mutant, in the phase of two knockout mutants, here we had all the activity confined to the deep layers. And this was in accordance with a wall of inhibition that we now had in the upper layers that is a consequence of the redistribution of the interneurons uh, in this cortex. So, <coughs> but we, with this experiment, we learned that projection neurons are actually required to guide interneurons uh, at a specific location in a very specific way. But they're also actively recruiting uh, interneurons at a specific location. So to address this question, I uh, designed an experiment by which I could create ectopically and experimentally a cluster of neurons of a specific identity in a place where it would normally never be located. Uh, in this case, below the, uh, the cerebral cortex, below the corpus callosum. And here I generate the cluster of uh, um, projection neurons, so of corticospinal motor neuron identity, so expressing markers of corticospinal motor neuron identity connecting to the uh, spinal cord. And uh, I asked the question whether now interneuron would actually be recruited to this ectopic location during development. Short answer is yes, uh, but here are the primary data that where you can see the cluster of 
uh, corticospinal, I mean, I should say corticofugal uh, neurons here, uh, which are labeled in uh, GFP and express the CTIP2, the prototypical marker for corticofugal uh, neurons, which are surrounded by GABAergic interneurons, while in the contralateral uh, side of the same exact brain, uh, we couldn't find any uh, GABAergic interneuron in that location. Interesting, the, the type of interneurons that get recruited to this ectopic location is also a function of the type of projection neuron we generated. Meaning, these uh, projection neurons that we have generated are corticofugal neurons so that are located in the deep layers of the cortex. And the interneurons that we find surrounding these clusters are the same interneurons that we can find in the deep layers of the cortex. So LHX6 positive uh, interneurons, somatostatin interneurons, but we never saw any VIP or relin or carotene interneurons surrounding this uh, cluster. And I also wonder if this was a specific feature of corticospinal motor neurons or was rather a, a more generic feature of projection neurons, the ability to recruit interneurons to these um, um, to specific location. So I generated a similar cluster, but still ectopically below the cortex, but this time of a different identity. So this time, those are callosal neurons which send their axon through the corpus callosum. They express all the molecular markers and hallmarks of uh, callosal neurons. And uh, I, but, but just impairing their migration, I could stop, the, I could create this cluster of um, neurons before, um, below the cortex and ask the same question, if interneurons would actually be recruited. And here, again, the primary data, you can see this time is a cluster of sub-B2 positive cells because our callosal um, uh, identity. And again, GABAergic interneurons uh, that are located around um, this cluster. And I hope by now I convince you that projection neurons and interneurons uh, pairing in the cortex is a highly specific um, developmental process and it's fundamental for the um, acquisition of an excitation and inhibition um, balance uh, in the cortex. Now what I, I see as a f the future steps to actually uh, fully understand how this mechanism works um, is actually understanding what, what is the molecular code that is probably underlying the the communication between interneurons and projection neurons, and specifically how projection neurons can guide interneurons to um, define um, locations. And uh, I um, intend to address this question by uh, purifying different classes of projection neurons and interneurons that are located in the same, um, in the same cortical layers. Um, purify them at different developmental time point, of course, profile them by RNA-seq and define what are the um, subtype specific um, hallmarks for uh, the different uh, population. And then together with uh, John Rin and Oscar, uh, sorry, John Rin and Loyal Goff at Harvard University, we have uh, already implemented an ad hoc pipeline to identify complementary molecules that are expressed on projection neurons and interneurons they are supposed to to be found in the same cortical layers to, that could potentially mediate this interaction. And I've already started some of the preliminary um, data and I'm confident that some of the um, promising molecules will come out uh, for functional tests. But next, with last thing I want to tell you is that once they've reached the same uh, location, the proper location in the cortex, how is the choice of the synaptic partner made? Is the identity of the neuron anyhow suggesting or indicating which kind of um, interneurons uh, should actually be um, synapting into? And there's a growing body of evidence that distinct classes of projection neurons receive their um, distinct synaptic inputs from inhibitors interneurons and even the change in identity of a specific class of projection neurons into another can change the inhibitor inputs that are received. So I really um, would like to contribute in understanding how the identity of projection neuron can dictate the um, formation of these cortical microcircuits. And to do so, I feel that we need to uh, fill um, a lack of information at the moment we have. We need to start building what is a, a microcircuit map of the cerebral cortex. And by, util by imp implementing a, a combinatorial toolbox of different monosynaptic viral tracer of the genetic manipulations and 
and uh, subtype specific tree line technically provided from, uh, by the Allen, I hope we can um, not only anatomically map this um, microcircuit uh, atlas, but also start probing and, and understanding better what is the relationship between structure and function in the developing brain and how much we sh it's, uh, um, it's plastic. And uh, with that, I'll just stop with the most important slides. Uh, I'd like to thank you, I'd like to thank uh, Paola, that has been a fantastic mentor over the past many years, <laughs> seven years almost. Um, and uh, <coughs> between my PhD and my postdocs, um, all the people in the lab that have made this journey really a fantastic experience and uh, especially the past member and some of the people that have uh, strongly contributed to uh, some of this uh, work. Uh, our collaborators, which have been instrumental for accomplishment of many of these uh, discovery, our funding, my PhD advisor, with, um, which was very uh, um, visionary in uh, allowing me to come to the States uh, when I was uh, only on my second year of uh, PhD. And of course, I thank you all for this fantastic opportunity and I'm looking forward to all the interaction. Thank you. All right, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand and someone will be around with the microphone. A beautiful talk, thank you. What's the uh, behavioral phenotype of the phase F2 uh, knockout? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we haven't done, um, I should say, systematic studies on that, but there are a few interesting aspects. They have a very abnormal gait to begin with. Um, differently from humans, mice have very uh, strong compensation from the rubrospinal uh, tract. So these mice can actually walk. They have a funny walk. They walk like penguins up to a month, like very um, weird, but they recover. Uh, up to after six weeks, six weeks, you're not able to distinguish a wild type from a knockout mouse. The other interesting uh, phenotype we observe is that they're, they're prone to develop seizures. Uh, that are usually stimulated by um, a strong noise or uh, heavy handling in the cage. So those are just observation from our animal care uh, givers. Um, but you know, we never really pursue any uh, behavioral study because FASF2 is very specifically expressed in the cortex in layer five and the lower level in layer six, but is also expressed in the amygdala and the hippocampus. So we were studying the straight knockout, but we're more interested now with a conditional knockout to address specific question about behavior on selective populations where we can actually make sure we are um, impairing a specific circuit rather than an overall. Um, cortex of brain. There's another question out there. <coughs> yes, what a beautiful talk. Um, yeah. Arturo uh, Alvarez Buya has made the interesting observation that there is sort of a ceiling level of interneurons that he can successfully graft into the cortex. Oh, yeah. And I'm just wondering from your data whether the actually the population of excitatory interneurons might be contributing to the constraints of how many interneurons can survive in cortex? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. I, I think that study was particularly interesting because it's not only showing us how, wh what are the potential of the brain um, in receiving, in accepting neurons that are uh, probably extra and numerous, but it's also telling us what are the limits because after a certain number, we can no longer uh, integrate interneurons. Uh, I don't have a final uh, answer for you, but I think that projection, the way I see, uh, I've been studying both projection neurons and interneurons, I strongly have the feeling that projection neurons make the, f the scaffold of our cortex and that interneurons integrate. And there is still definitely a lot of plasticity and probably much more on the interneuron side than on the projection neuron side. Um, there is one aspect that I'm really intrigued about and is actually uh, referring to the hippocampus. The same interneurons that populate the cortex are exactly the same. I mean, developmentally speaking and you know, molecularly speaking, we don't know the difference at the moment between the one that populate the cortex and the one that populate the hippocampus. Um, and it's interesting to see how interneurons in the hippocampus 
continue throughout the whole life, integrating into new circuits with new production neurons that are constantly uh, replenished, while the one in the cortex have sort of established their connections already within a month uh, of a mouse life. So I don't think anybody has ever tested the possibility that even the one in the cortex are more prone to plasticity and more integration of functional circuit. That I think is a great uh, field to explore. Um, my question is, could you elaborate on your mechanism? I mean, on selecting complementary molecules that, you know, involved in interactions between projection neurons and inhibitor neurons? <coughs> sure, thanks. It's, um, it's a very complex screen and uh, involves m many, multi many different cell types. Uh, unfortunately, as we heard this morning for the interneurons, we are still lacking molecular markers that allow us to define, especially early on, the different classes of interneurons. So at the moment, I'm just relying on uh, genetic tracers from LHX6 and uh, 5HT, so mainly MG versus CG derived interneurons, which are um, complementary, populating the, um, the cerebral cortex. And the projection neuron side, um, employing an um, intracellular staining approach to purify over different times the three classes of production neuron, corticothalamic, corticospinal, and callosal neurons. Um, the, the, the way we're addressing this um, pipeline is more um, on hypothesis base. So the idea is that uh, interneurons are feeling something within the layers uh, and uh, stop their migration is suggesting that uh, from both the, the in from both the knockout model and the gain of function model, the seem to suggest that there are some secreted molecules or some cell cell interaction that are actually um, mediating this um, stop uh, behavior. Uh, we have no direct evidence. We haven't done an in vitro experiment. We decided to go straight in vivo to actually uh, understand um, this mechanism. And that's one of the filtering we're applying in our pipeline. So molecules that are actually expressed on the surface and have a complementary uh, molecules on the, on the um, counterpart, the interneuron part in this case. Hi, Simona. Great talk. Thank um, you. I had a quick question. When you ectopically generate the uh, colossal projection neurons, yes. do they also show uh, specific recruitment of the CG interneurons, or are they more broad? Yeah, I, for sure, I don't have the answer for that. The only thing I can tell you is that what I did was um, pairing a beer due study to this kind of analysis. So the idea in the field was that projection neurons and interneurons pair by age. So interneurons that are born in E12.5 are found in the same layers of projection neurons that are born in E12.5. And this didn't make sense to me. <laughs> I couldn't believe that neurons had a clock. They're born from different regions. They migrate totally different routes. So time was not really, it did not convince me. So I decided to do an experiment where I actually beard date both the production neurons and the interneurons. And in this case, both the experiment that I show you for the ectopic clusters, the um, neurons were born at E14.5. So I inject E14, beard E14.5, and I check if neurons now were matching, production neurons and interneurons were matching by age or by uh, type. And interesting, I found the corticospinal motor neurons that normally would be born two days earlier, but are now I generated the E14.5 ectopically and experimentally, were still recruiting interneurons that were born E12.5. So they were still matching with the interneuron that would normally reach the deep layers of the cortex, while the E14.5 callosal neurons that had uh, stopped migrating were still recruiting mainly interneurons born E14.5. So I don't have the subtype specificity, but I strongly believe that it's still identity driving their interaction rather than time.